Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. I'm Christina. Hello to everyone chiming in from California. What, I know what there's are, a lot. A lot of area. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, we're part of the Nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. Nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix science with cocktails, live music, and more. We are officially back in person as of last month. So all you people from California, Bay Area, come by if you get the chance. Um, night School is our little pandemic baby, which is a little virtual version, um, bringing some nightlife home to you. Christina, today is our 50th. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a surprise to her. Um, yeah. But we this is our 50th virtual program. I'm not counting the first one with Nigel, um, but it's exciting. Um, okay, but to tonight's program, we are going on a little adventure into coral reef research and technology, um, starting from teeny tiny micro imaging and scaling up to macro satellite views. So first up, uh, we have Dr. Jules Jaffe, a research oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography down in San Diego. He will unveil the lives and styles of coral anatomy and physiology and demonstrate the use of several microscopes and other very, very cool tech to highlight the micro world of corals. Um, up next, we have the Academy's Chair of Aquatic Biology, Dr. Pim Bongart. Uh, his lab focuses on coral conservation genomics or reefscape genomics, which he'll talk more to you about, um, and creates advanced underwater 3D reef reconstructions to study the ecology of coral reef organisms. And finally, we're looking at reefs all the way from space. Um, we have research scientist, Dr. Emma Kennedy, who will talk about the Allen Coral Atlas and how advances in satellite tech and processing has finally made the goal of mapping the planet's coral reefs achievable. So get ready for lots of very cool imagery tonight. Yes, and I also wanna just say thanks to everyone who's been watching with us. Um, we see you in the comments a lot of the time. So so we know who you are and we see you. So thanks for watching however many you've seen with us. If it's been all 50, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, thank you too. Um, can we just shout out really quick, Ignite yes. the Spark Within. Um, yes. They've watched every single one. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> We've noted you every time. So yes. thanks for watching with us. Um, okay, yes. So as always, tonight's program is live. So continue saying hi, we see we see everything that you're commenting. Um, so let us know where you're watching from, all you Californians and beyond. Um, let us know if it's your first time joining us or if you're a night school regular. And we'll have Q and A's after everyone's talk, so make sure to get your questions in the chat. Um, and we will now turn it over to Jules. Hi everybody, I'm Jules Jaffe. I am a research oceanographer at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. And I'm delighted to be here at the Cal Academy. I spent 10 years living in the Bay Area, went to Berkeley, and I think it's one of the best science places in the world. So it's a delight for me to be here talking to you tonight about adventures in coral microscopy. So this is probably my most boring slide. <laughs> so I'll go through it quickly. Uh, what is it we do in my lab? So I'm a kind of a techie kind of guy. I'm an image processor. I'm a bit of a physicist. Uh, and we invent instruments. I think that it's uh, important for technology to aid the study of the planet ecology. And my particular interests are actually in uh, imaging. And we do a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through all the details here. But we're interested in photosynthesis with a new instrument I'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, we're going to be measuring in situ bacteria. Uh, we're interested in soundscapes, a really sexy area, listening to things. And we've also been recently getting more interested in using um, deep learning, which obviously is a whole hot area now, and it's really helping us to do better science. So moving right along, uh, about a decade or so ago, we were super fortunate to get a very nice grant from the Keck Foundation in Los Angeles. And at that point, uh, we had been sort of noodling around with a bunch of different microscopes. And I had the idea <laughs> to build a microscope that we could give to a diver 
And the diver could then go down and take pictures at very high resolution because the importance of doing things in situ is paramount to my philosophy. And it's not that we can't duplicate stuff in the lab, but in my interest is the ultimate is to do things in situ. So in pursuit of that, we uh, built a couple of these underwater microscopes. And I'm not gonna go through the details too much, but if you're interested, this is, we, we, we deployed this in 2015 and 2014. So at that time, the, mature, the, the uh, technology was relatively mature, but it, it, this is a decade old. And one of our interests is in maker technology and we're building like all kinds of cool stuff that's really inexpensive and can tell us lots more. But we use uh, condensing optics, we use uh, squishy lenses. And here's uh, a picture on the lower right that we took in the lab of coral polyps, just in case you wanna know what the scale is. These guys, uh, this is about a millimeter across and we'll get more into that in a second. So uh, a seafloor microscope. I wanna play this piece that occurred in the New York Times with the graces of Christina and Lynn. These are coral polyps. They're the tiny living animals that build huge coral reefs. And this is the first time you've ever seen them in this kind of detail. U.S. and Israeli scientists made the first microscope that, that can see living corals in their natural state down to the detail of one micron. That's one hundredth the width of a human hair. In a test run, they put a loose block of coral next to coral of a different species. Here's the resulting conflict speeded way up. Those ghostly billows? That's a coral polyp sending its gut out to digest the enemy. That's how they fight. Even though these polyps are really tiny, what happens to them determines what happens to the whole big reef. That's why scientists built this microscope. Divers can run it, or it can be set up on the seafloor to run on its own. Corals don't always fight. They can be nice to members of their own species. Look, they're kissing. Well, actually, they're probably sharing food. But that's nice, right? Yeah, thanks for the live feed on that, Christina and Lynn. So um, what was cool about that was we published this article in Nature Communications and it was well reviewed. And we actually, there was a funny thing. They said, the first reviewer, well, people did this in the 1970s. I'm like, yeah, right. What's you know, 45 years later, can we do something better? So uh, the thing I love about this is we're able to portray science to the public. And it was actually one of the, top hits on the New York Times website that week. And we got a lot of great publicity. And my goal is not only to do science, to do technology, but also to do outreach. So that was a lot of fun. Okay, moving along. Uh, not a lot of time again to talk about this. Getting beyond anatomy, we're interested in physiology. So what are the processes that contribute to photosynthesis by the little teeny organisms, the symbionts that live inside of the coral, that the coral kind of farms. And uh, as far as I know, to create junk food for the coral. And what happens when a coral bleaches? What happens to those little symbionts? Do they decide to leave or are they kicked out? So we wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation and fortunately they did accept it. So we're now in the process of working with some people that I'm sure uh, Pim knows really well. <laughs> uh, Stu Sandin and Jen Smith here at Scripps Oceanography to now look at the physiology of the symbionts as corals of bleaching. And to me, this is like the next step. First, we do anatomy, then we do physiology. Moving along, uh, I wanted to show you kind of a fun movie that we took in the lab. So even though I'm a kind of in situ kind of guy, we decided to do a bleaching experiment in the lab. And in the process of Doing that, we found some really, really cool stuff. So uh, here I'm gonna show you this video. I'll sort of talk over it as well. So Ben, amazing engineers in my group for a number of years in my lab, 
we basically put a coral uh, into the lab and we slowly heated up the temperature as, and we could see actually, so what you're looking at now is the surface of the coral, the white you're seeing is the skeleton and those little flowery things are actually the polyp and we have fancy names for everything in science. So we call them zooxanthellae. Those are the little tiny polyps. Or those are little tiny symbionts that live inside the coral. And one of the crazy things that we saw was that these little organisms were actually aggregating subsurface before they were ejected out through the uh, polyp orifice. And so here we're gonna use a little bit of image processing to actually superimpose the time lapse of these things. And I guess I just wanna highlight the discovery process that's involved in imaging. And that's what I love about oceanography is that we can invent new instruments, we can see something that no one has ever seen before, and we can do our science in ways people had imagined, but were not capable of. Just wanted to show you with the coral bleaching, and we'll go to the next slide, hopefully. My computer will, we're not gonna stay on the same slide. Okay, so um, one of the fun things we've been doing now, working with other people that my uh, co-speakers probably know, uh, Daniel Wankersert and Michael Kuhl, who more or less thought about the idea of using a technology that people use to look at uh, your eye. So if you go for an eye exam, uh, sometimes they'll put you in an instrument called an optical coherence tomography system or OCT, which actually gets a three-dimensional image of your eye. And these guys had the idea to take this OCT, instead of putting it in front of a person's eye, let's put it over a coral and see if we could see the three-dimensional structure of the coral at this micro scale. So they actually did this. And here's another example of more or less the same coral we've been featuring here, Porcelopera. And uh, that's what the machine produced. And then they said to me, well, you know, one of the things we're super interested in, okay, for a point of reference here, what you're seeing is our picture that was on the cover of Physics Today, it was on the cover of the Keck Foundation. And these little teeny round balls are actually the symbionts and they're 10 microns. And the technology for taking this is we do a sort of Z scan and then we superimpose all the in-focus images. And the green is this green fluorescent protein, which is another whole amazing story that we don't have time to talk about first discovered in jellyfish. So now using the magic of optical coherence tomography, we can start to see the three-dimensional structure of this polyp. And then the data they handed me was a three-dimensional matrix. And so I love just getting this data and seeing what I can do to try to define the surface area of that coral. And the importance of surface area, I did wanna highlight how important that is for the diffusion of nutrients and also expelling waste. And I did wanna point out that um, the surface area has come into view this year, of course, with COVID. And the surface area of our lungs is an incredible thing. And of course, uh, it's important for that to, to be integral, but I did wanna relate it to something that we can think about in our own world. So taking these three-dimensional uh, images from the OCT, I was able to define a bunch of these polyps. And then through the magic of uh, a number of algorithms that I wrote in a conventional uh, image processing or signal processing system called MATLAB. I was able to create these point clouds, which I displayed in, um, in one of the uh, standard libraries after I had defined these interfaces. And then here's a single polyp. And then I produced this image, which is actually a single polyp. And what you're seeing now is highlighted are the surfaces of this polyp and we were thus able to compute its surface area and learn important things about the relationship between uh, volume and surface area for corals. And uh, the other thing I've been really interested in my whole career has been virtual reality microscopy. So could we shrink you down to this miniature world and make you into a microbe or a little phyto and it's physics that is different than what we expect at our macroscopic level. So uh, we're actually in the process of creating a game in Unity called the Micronaut. And what you're seeing here is the actual three-dimensional polyp field that I recorded. 
And a bunch of those little red guys, those are the symbiodinium and also some other organisms that are zooplankton. And uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to have people play this game. You see, we've already lost. The temperature's not too high. The corals are bleaching. If there are any Unity experts out there that want to help out, I'm um, game. So thank you very much. I would be happy to answer any questions now. Hi, Jules. <laughs> um, that was really cool. I always like seeing the game aspect that you were talking about. Um, we do have some questions. So the first one is from Brittany. Um, can you speak to the roles of viruses in the hollow beyond? I don't know if I pronounced that right. Yeah. So uh, I am not an expert in viruses, but one of my colleagues, Forrest Rower, who works at San Diego State, is an incredible expert in coral ecology. And they do play an important role, but I have to admit that I'm aware of that. And, uh, and Forrest also played this amazing role. Uh, if you know about the story of this bacteriophage that they invented to cure this guy, uh, Forrest also played another role. So Forrest Rower, San Diego State, He's wonderful. <laughs> um, next question is, what's the most fascinating thing you saw for the first time with the underwater microscope? Oh, geez. Um, I think the fighting that we showed you in the New York Times article yeah. was really amazing. I mean, the story is we were trying to do an experiment to measure corals eat plankton as well. And there are other corals that live photosynthesized. We're studying those in Israel with our colleagues. But when we saw those uh, corals fighting, we were like, wow, this is, I mean, people had sort of seen it in the lab, but when we saw it in, in situ, it was uh, really amazing. Um, so that's one of the things. And then we have a bunch of microscopes on our pier that are running 24 seven. We have 22 billion images. I have wow. a collection of jappyweb.ucsd.edu. Go check out our microscopes. And I am wow. continually amazed at the diversity of morphology. Imagine a weightless world where you can take a shape that doesn't have you being pulled down by gravity. Mm -hmm. Creates a lot of opportunity. Cool. Um, okay, question from Sarah. What are the implications of the Zuzan belly migrating together during bleaching. Why is that their strategy or reaction? Also a comment on amazing footage. Oh, thank you so much. It's one of my joys to get you excited of you, meaning everybody. So we don't quite know. There is a concept of Reynolds number, which means the bigger you are, uh, the sort of easier it is for you to move. Uh, but that's a wonderful question. And that's the only possibility that I could think of. Uh, so who knows? But that's my hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> OK, a uh, question from Tracy. How do you determine which coral reefs to check out with the, microsc with the microscope? And how long can the microscope stay underwater for? How, how deep can it be used? Right, the so, uh, there's two questions. Um, the microscope can go as deep as most divers can go that don't have to do like ridiculous amount of, um, you know, uh, stops. So it's rated for 100 meters, which is really deeper than you'd, you'd ever want to go. Um, the decisions about where to take it are being made by our colleagues. There's a 100 Island Challenge, Jen Smith and Stu Sandin. Uh, and they actually work all over the world. Pim, I'm sure, knows them. Uh, they work, they just got back from the Maldives. They were in Palmyra. Um, you know, I rely to some extent on inspiration from the application scientists. And my goal is to partner with those people so we can work together technology and ecology to learn more about the environment itself. Very cool. Um, did you see any notable difference in behavior between lab corals and in situ corals? Whoa, you guys are asking some really good questions. <laughs> and what I tell my students is don't be afraid to say I don't know because they're going to catch you if you don't agree to that. Um, 
I'd have to think about that some more. I mean, most of our work is uh, being done, you know, in situ. Um, and um, I just imagine, you know, so one of the things we saw in our science article was the uh, when corals bleach, the algae start to grow on them. And when we did some studies, we were actually able to see that the algae were growing kind of between the polyps, because I think corals have a pretty exotic way to shake off stuff. And of course, if the fish aren't around to eat off the algae, then they got even a bigger problem. But I don't think those could have been duplicated in the lab, that kind of in situ experiment. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Can you see microbes on the coral? Ah, uh, this is a wonderful question. Uh, the answer is uh, we haven't yet tried. Um, we do have a new instrument that can see microbes, but the problem is the higher the resolution, not only the smaller the field of view, but the smaller the depth of field. So we're looking now with the microbes, we'd be looking at a one and a half millimeter by one. And we can see bacteria that are a micron in size, mm -hmm. but uh, we haven't tried on the corals. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay, last question. Have you used the microscope to diagnose coral diseases in the field? Ah, uh, again, the answer is <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that work, so I want to make a difference here between like a macro zoom and a, and a microscope, our resolution is much higher than you would get in a macro zoom. And I know there are a lot of people that are doing macro zoom studies uh, to study coral diseases. So the answer is, uh, it's not a thing that we would typically look at, but of course, if there was a disease, we'd be interested in analyzing the, the physiology of it. Um, well, thank you so much, Jules, for being on Night School tonight. It <laughs> was fun. My pleasure. And hello, San Francisco. I love that place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come by and visit when, when it's safe and you, you can. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Jules. Um, up next, we have Dr. Pim Bongart. Hello. So thank you for having me um, today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, the work that we're doing in my lab um, at the California Academy of Sciences um, in San Francisco. Um, and uh, basically we're using a combination of, um, of imaging methods uh, as well as genomics to study the ecology um, of coral reefs. And um, to be a little bit more specific, we're basically using imaging methods to create large scale um, but high resolution 3D models of the reef. Uh, which we refer to as reefscapes, um, and then basically um, study or use genomics to study how um, the diversity of reef organisms is distributed across these reefscapes and the, the environmental gradients um, that they represent. And so today I'll be mostly talking about the, the imaging aspect um, rather than the genomics, but just to give you a little bit of background of what's the um, what that's sort of inspired by is the fact that um, after doing a, a decade of um, genetic population genetic research on on corals on reef building corals uh, time after time and we kept this discovering this sort of undescribed diversity uh, within coral populations that we couldn't really explain and so just to give you a bit of background on that normally when we do population genetic studies on corals and often that's look uh, to look at the connectivity between different islands where corals occur um, we're just looking at the population level. And that's mostly because we just simply haven't had the tools to, to map out these reef environments. And so mostly the collection of individuals is rather anonymous. And so when we find a lot of genetic structuring within a population, it's really hard to actually figure out what causes that genetic structuring. And so with these new imaging tools that have become available, we finally have the means to actually um, look at these populations at the individual level. And, and that's what I'm gonna be talking mostly about um, today. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this fits within the, the broader work that's being done at the Academy, because those of you that are familiar with the California Academy of Sciences, you obviously know that we have this very large natural history collection 
um, hosting more than 45 million specimens, which obviously are a very important resource uh, to scientists to study biodiversity and, and study how it's distributed um, in space, but also how it's changing over time, which is obviously something that's becoming increasingly um, important. Um, and it's becoming especially important when we're talking about coral reefs, um, because you, as you all know, um, coral reefs face all these different stressors, whether it's the, the warming of the oceans, ocean acidification, the intensifying of storm events, or, or more local stressors like overfishing or nutrient runoff. Um, yeah, and so my lab focuses mostly on, on reef building corals, and, and we're really trying to get a good understanding of um, the diversity um, that's out there and, and how that diversity will change and how different species of corals will respond differently to these, to these changing environmental conditions. Um, and one thing that's become sort of really emergent is that there's also a lot of variation within species. Um, so to really understand how, how coral species individually are going to respond to these stressors, we need to look at what's happening inside of populations. And so this is a photo that I always like to share, which is from my uh, colleague, Luis Rocha, which is our curator of ichthyology. And it's a photo that he took during a bleaching event in uh, French Polynesia. And it really clearly shows um, so some good examples of, a, of one species, or I should say two colonies of one species that are occurring right next to each other, but one bleaches and the other one doesn't. And so a big goal in the lab is to try to finally delve into some of that unexplained genetic diversity and figure out how it relates to these, these different phenotypic um, responses. And so for a while, we've been playing with this idea of how, how can we actually expand on our physical natural history um, collections that we have, um, but capture more of that individual variation that you find within species. Um, but at the same time also, find better ways of characterizing the phenotypes. And so not just focusing on morphology, like normally we would collect the coral skeleton, we collect DNA, um, but in the collection it's the, the bleached skeleton. But how can we augment that information um, to also understand more about how these different corals are, are responding in the field? And so we came up with this idea of, of establishing these virtual collections and basically leveraging the fact that um, corals, unlike mammals, and just mostly stay within the same spot. So as long as we have a means of, of mapping these corals out individually, uh, we can follow them over time. And so the whole idea is that we just um, non-invasively swap these corals for DNA, but then leave them out in the field and photograph them each um, or every six months to really look at how they're responding to different stressors are coming through, quantify growth rates, um, etc. And for a long time, doing these kind of studies just simply wasn't possible because we didn't have the means to create high resolution um, underwater maps, nor did, uh, for example, GPS work underwater. So that that's, was a real sort of um, hurdle. And so today I'm going to talk about a, a project in the lab called the, the Coral Scape Project um, that we set up in uh, Curacao in the Caribbean, uh, where we tried to do just that. And so um, the first thing we had to do, obviously, is, um, is to come up with a camera system that simultaneously could um, document these large areas um, and create these maps, as well as really um, create high resolution photographs of each individual coral so that we can characterize these responses and these phenotypes. And so um, here you see a picture of that camera system. It basically is a, it's an SLR system that has a 50 megapixel camera, so really re high resolution. It has uh, four strobing lights, and that's really important because we decided that we really wanted to study also um, across the entire environmental gradient or the depth gradient that corals occur, so all the way down to mesophotic depths. Um, also leveraging the, the, the closed circuit reed breeders that we um, support at the, at the Cal Academy. Uh, that allow us to go to greater depths and spend um, four to five hours um, underwater. Um, and as you can see, it's mounted on a scooter, basically because we keep adding things to this camera system. And so it became harder and harder to swim around. And so eventually we just ended up putting it in front of a scooter. Um, there's also two sonars uh, integrated uh, into the camera system that basically allow or give feedback to the diver to keep it at a consistent height above the substrate, as well as keeping it parallel. And that's really important to get even lighting um, for the, the creation of the 3D models uh, that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, it also has a, a USB-L modem, so that helps us with the uh, geo-positioning 
of these things because it basically provides the camera with a relative position uh, to a, a beacon on the surface um, that, that can receive GPS. Um, yeah, and so we set up this, um, this project called Coralscape in Curaçao, which is located in the Southern Caribbean, and um, it's off the coast of Venezuela. Um, so we set up seven locations, and each of those locations, we established plots at a different depth. So at five meters, 10, 20, 40, 60 meters, so 60 meters being 200 feet. Um, and at each of those five depths, we basically have 100 square meters of reef that we image in detail. Um, and the goal was basically to, to characterize 20,000 corals in the field that we can follow over time and that we now are see, um, gradually sequencing uh, group by group um, to eventually build this large database of uh, genotype, phenotype um, information. And just to give you a bit of an idea of what that would look like in the field, um, so this is from a, a day in the field in Curaçao. So most of our diving and work that we do are is actually done from shore, and it's partially uh, it's one of the reasons that we chose Curaçao as a location to work. So there's a lot of uh, dragging equipment, all the safety gear out, obviously, um, which um, is part of diving to these greater depths in case the rebreather fails. We have to carry extra gases. Um, this is me actually um, taking the scooter and scootering out to the the first depth of where we have our plots. And so once we get to the to the to those depths, we swim the camera around. So this is me. I think that, yeah, it's about 200 feet, 60 meters. Um, and basically, to capture this this area of reef, we have to just keep swimming back and forth. You can see the camera strobing. So every second, it takes a picture. Uh, and the goal is just to get many many photos that are um, that have great amount of overlap, um, which is necessary um, to create these um, 3D reconstructions. And so. This is just the first several hundred of these photos to just give you an ID, and you can clearly see that there's there's an extreme amount of overlap between each of the photos. Um, and then we use this method called structure from motion to create a, a 3D model um, from these photographs. And from that, again, we can create these uh, what are called orthomosaics or ortho projections, which are basically our maps where we can reference each of our um, corals um, inside these uh, these maps. But at the same time, it also provides us with the resolution to really look at each of all these in, of um, these individual coral colonies and study their growth, their responses, their morphology, um, etc. And so this technique, structure for motion, uh, has become really established now in coral reef ecology um, because it's opening up all these different um, opportunities to, to study coral reefs that we didn't have before. Um, and just to give you a bit of idea, so that reef that you just saw me uh, swimming across. This is actually the 3D model, so a fly-through of that model. And so it's at 60 meters. That's why it's relatively barren, because at those depths, there's very few coral species that can actually still survive. And then all these brown plates, those are basically the corals. So those are those um, plating corals that are adapted to these low light um, conditions, and basically have this, this shape to capture as much light as they, they still can um, at these depths. And so we've got these 3D models that we can interact with, which is also extremely helpful because even with rebreeders, um, we still have very limited time ultimately that we can spend um, at these depths, particularly at mesophotic depths. And so being able to virtually access these reef environments um, in our office, obviously is less fun, but it's, it's really productive um, that we can um, do a lot more in-depth research on these, uh, on these reefs. But, um, as a main focus in our lab is obviously the link of, of this imagery uh, with genomic data. I'll just show you a little bit of what that looks like. So this is actually from a project of a PhD student of mine, Kat Prata, who's studying these dominant plating corals um, in the Caribbean, so agaricias. And as we fly through this 3D model, you basically see all the, the coral colonies that she sampled highlighted. And so you can see as well here that some of them are bleached, some are not bleached, because this is actually during a warming event. And then on the left, you see the phylogenetic tree. Um, and you basically see in red highlighted the corals that are currently in view, um, as well as there's the genetic relatedness. So other than you know, really delving into the genomes and looking at specific associations of genes, mutations in genes with particular phenotypes, um, it also gives us an idea of the, of the genetic relatedness, which we can then use um, to study processes like reproduction. So for example, at the moment, there is a couple of clones highlighted that have an identical genotype. And so we know that they have originated through, uh, through a process of fragmentation. Um, and um, 
yeah, with this data, we can do these like, parentage analysis and, and study these ecological ideas. But ultimately, the idea is that we're building this large um, database of the phenotypes by photographing these each individual corals time over time. And so this is an example for one of these corals. Um, and it's showing you here at four different time points. You can clearly see that in November 2019 and December 2020, uh, there was a warm water bleaching event. So each of these individual 20,000 corals, we can assess how they responded to these warming events, um, how that resulted or affected their growth rates. Um, and so really establish that link between different um, genomic data or genotypes and, and the phenotype. Um, but what's really great as well, because we have these large area maps, we can also extract a lot of information about their environment and also look at that interaction between, um, yeah. And so, for example, the positioning on the reef, the amount of radiance that they receive, but also um, uh, interactions with other species uh, on the reef, like macroalgae, um, et cetera. So I hope I've been able to give you a bit of an idea of how we're using these, um, these imaging methods to really augment our um, genomic analysis. Um, for us, it's really a, a game changer in that we can finally look at that um, the genetic diversity that we couldn't explain within reef systems. And ultimately, we're hoping that this will help us um, you know, better understand the basic biology of coral reef organisms, but also um, understand and, and figure out how we can best project, um, protect coral populations going into the future. And obviously, uh, because we're following so many individual corals, it's also a mass screening for potentially more resilient genotypes that could be used in, in restoration efforts, ensuring that they are as effective um, as they can be. And just in case you just wanted to have a, a bit of a play with the models that I've uh, showed in this uh, presentation, I uploaded two of those to Sketchfab. They're obviously a lot lower resolution than the originals, but it gives you a bit of an idea. So on the bottom right, you can see um, the, the web address if you wanted to have a look at those um, two models. Um, yeah, and then to finish off, just wanted to obviously thank all uh, the members of the lab, past and present, as well as our local partners, um, our scientific diving team and, and the funders, um, of course. Thank you very much. Hey, Tim, that was awesome. Um, yeah, so we've got some questions for you. Great. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so first of all, how long did it take you to get the tech and like the route of how to swim by, right? So you could create those 3D maps. Like, it seems like it has to be a very specific, like how often the camera goes and how you swim around it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So I think it took us about two or three field trips to really figure that out, because obviously you can try a lot of different things out in the in the, in the field, but it's not until you get back, to, until you can really process that and, and play around with different things and, and work out what works best. Obviously there's, a, there's other groups using the same kind of methods, and so we've learned mm -hmm. a lot from them as well. Um, but I think our main challenge was doing it also at mesophotic depths, because a lot of these efforts mm -hmm. of imaging reefs um, is done at shallow depths and using natural light. Um, and as soon as you start in using artificial lighting, like we do, uh, it makes everything um, a lot more complicated. And that's, for example, why we have these sonars integrated so that we can actually make sure that we have a fixed distance and keeping it parallel. And, and so that was a real challenge. And so, um, yeah, that took us a year, I think, to figure out, um, yeah, to get that right. Yeah. Um, how much does your scooter weigh? Your the camera scooter. scooter. I think it's like about twenty pounds. Oh, yeah, okay. that's a that's a rough guess. So it's not not um, too much. And then the great thing is how we've set it up at the moment is that you can actually take the camera apart from the scooter, and so basically mm -hmm. that allows us to take it onto the beach, and then so I jump in the water, put all my extra tanks on, and then someone basically hands the the scooter and the camera. We connect them, and then mm -hmm. we can. So it's also the design to do it from shore. Cool. Um, some general uh, coral questions. So here's one from Tracy. Um, can a yeah. coral come back after it has bleached? Um, she says the slide where you have four separate images of the same coral over two years looked like it may have bleached and then the next time it was back to being colorful and alive. Yeah, that's a really good question because um, when a coral bleaches, it doesn't 
um, automatically mean it will die. So it really depends because obviously no longer have its uh, Zooks and Telly, the symbiotic algae that provides mm -hmm. it with a lot of the energy. Um, and then it sort of depends on the species and how warm it really is, how long it can survive without these symbionts. And so in, in that example, where you see that mm -hmm. same coral at four different time points, um, indeed, um, it bleaches and then actually recovers. So the Zooks and Telly populate and recover. And so that was the case in Curacao is that we had two of these bleaching events and they were pretty severe in the sense that a lot of corals were affected, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't last for a long time. And so a lot of those corals recover, which for us makes it like sort of the ultimate um, experiment because we can actually assess the bleaching susceptibility of a lot of corals without them actually dying, um, which is mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah. Um, and how do you track the same, because you had the exact same frame of the same coral over a long period of time. How do you do that? How do you yeah. keep track of here? Yeah, so see? basically what we do is that um, when those 3D models are, are created, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, in that process, um, the computer saves the, the, the raw images that are associated with each, each of the points in, the, in those point clouds. And so we can always go back to the, those raw images, which is very useful. But then what we do for multiple time points is that we align the point clouds so that they perfectly overlay each other. And so that's a really quick way where we can actually scroll through those different time points. Um, but it also means that, yeah, we can actually come up in the database with a one specific coordinate for each coral, for the centroid of each coral um, to, re to refer to it, which is then consistent across time points. Cool. I love that you called um, your 3D reconstructions just virtual collections. I just, I just remember that you said that, and I really liked it. Um, yeah. Two people in a row wanted to know what instruments or software do you use for genomic analysis? For genomic analysis? Yeah. Well, a lot of uh, nowadays with genomic analysis, it's basically uh, a, um, what would you call it? It's basically putting together a whole lot of tools. So a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. constantly in bioinformatics, different tools get produced and are accessible, a lot of them through GitHub. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, um, so and it depends, obviously, what kind of analysis we're doing. Some of them are using a reference genome. And so that's a lot more for but some of them, we don't have a reference genome, so it's different methods. Um, yeah, so yeah, a lot of different software. Cool. Um, okay. So Dennis asks, coral is sensitive to ocean warming, but some types of corals are more affected, are affected more than others. So as the ocean warms, do you think one type of coral might just replace another? And yeah, have you seen we're any already of that? seeing that. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, it's a really good question. But we see these major shift in uh, in assemblages, right? Where some corals become more dominant. And that's part of like of the research we're doing as well. Like we have two postdocs in the lab. And they're basically looking at opposing things. Um, so one is looking at a coral species that's become extremely rare. Um, so as opposed to Alejandra Hernandez. Whereas then we have Michelle Aclatis, who is actually looking at uh, bioeroding sponges, which have become a lot more abundant. So there's definitely all these winners and losers as well. And so trying to understand the effect of that on the on the community is really critical. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we have time for a couple more. You've got ton of ton of questions coming in. Um, trying to keep up. Um, so Sarah asks, do you have a hypothesis that greater genetic diversity of a given reef is related to resilience over time? So if a reef yeah. has has survived through multiple bleaching events. Yeah, well, that's definitely sort of the general hypothesis, right? That greater mm -hmm. genetic diversity conveys greater resilience. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Um, yes. And then um, it, since you're diving in mesophytic reefs and you have to use, you know, lights on the camera, does that affect, have you seen that affect coral behavior at all? Do the lights? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. It's actually something that we wondered about, you know, because obviously they receive so little light and they're weak on, you know, fleshing these corals um, yeah. a thousand <laughs> times basically with these lights. So we were actually worried about that. And in our initial mm -hmm. assessments, we have looked at it, small areas and exposed them to strobing lights and revisited those. But we haven't seen, I mean, maybe on the very short term, there might be some effect, but we haven't seen any, yeah, apparent, like, yeah, visible impacts uh, of that. Cool. 
Um, well, thanks so much for joining us, Pim. I'm glad we had you, finally had you on yeah, this no, program. And I, yeah, and I dropped the links to the um, Sketchfab. So if you want to poke around and look at the reefs, I dropped them in the comments. I can do it again after this. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Pim. Really? No, thanks for having me. <laughs> See you later. All right, up next, uh, we have Dr. Emma Kennedy. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Night School, for hosting me as well. So I'm live streaming to you this evening from the east coast of Australia. So it's actually my lunchtime here in Townsville, which is on the Bindal and Wulguru Kaba peoples land. And um, I guess we're, we're taking a microscopic look at reefs this evening with Jules from the polyp scale and then seeing what they look like on the kind of coral scape scale with Pim. And so now with me, we're going to zoom right out and take a real broad look at coral reefs from a fresh perspective um, from space. So my lab at the Remote Sensing Research Center at the University of Queensland have been helping build the first ever complete global habitat map of coral reefs and it's called the Allen Coral Atlas. And so I wanted to share with you this evening um, well, why we're doing this in the first place and show you some of the exciting technological advances that are helping us map reefs. And then um, finally invite you to get involved as well if you're interested. And so of course, mapping the oceans is really difficult to do um, on a big scale for the simple reason that we can't easily view it. And you'll have seen from Jules and Pim's talks that they both actually were using diving to get under there and look at the reefs. And one of the first attempts at uh, Atlas of the world's reefs was by Charles Darwin in 1842. So his map was from his observations of his journey on the Beagle, and he mapped different reef types um, right around the world. And over time, his map was added to by subsequent explorers. Um, and of course, he didn't have scuba apparatus back then, but luckily for um, coral reef mappers, coral reefs are really famous for growing in very clear water. And so early explorers were able to view some of the big structures that corals build um, through the water and start mapping from boats. And then later in the 1950s, we were able to start using aircraft to get a new perspective of reefs um, from above and improve the accuracy of those maps. And the real um, revolutionary step in global coral reef mapping kind of came at the beginning of the 21st century when computing power allowed us to start compiling and digitizing all of those um, individual handmade historic maps. And so that was done in the 1990s by the World Conservation Monitoring Center, who tried to create the first digital atlas. And the advent of satellites meant we could also start positioning imaging sensors in space and start looking down on Earth. And so the Millennium Mapping Project began at the turn of the century and used high quality cameras on um, this satellite called Landsat 7 to take uh, 30 meter pixel images of Earth and gave the team working on that project um, really the ability to start mapping reefs accurately on a really unprecedented scale. And so combining those Landsat images with the historical mapping, um, we finally in 2009 had the first digital global coral reef atlas, um, which has a distribution of all the world's reefs on it. And that's really where we'd got to for a long time. And this extent map is still being used by scientists today. And it is an amazing resource, but it does have its limitations. So really it just provides us with the outline um, of the reefs, so there's no information on the kind of habitat. And because the areas haven't been mapped consistently using the same method, there's areas um, where it's the maps don't look quite the same. Um, you can see some areas here in Heron Reef, you can see outside the, in the extent there's some deep water areas mapped, um, some very odd looking reefs there, and some reefs have been missed altogether. And I think really the main limitation of the current global map is that it only shows us the extent of the reef, so the outline. And you'll quickly see from this photograph of Heron Reef on the Great Barrier Reef, there's actually a lot of really interesting variation going on across that reef. And a lot of that variation is driven by differences in 
waves and depth and light. And that kind of determines what different organisms can grow, just like Pim was showing with a different depths um, and dictate what the reef really looks like. And if you've ever done any diving or snorkeling, you might be familiar with some of this variation. So you might have dived on a reef slope um, where there's a lot more fish and corals um, compared to perhaps a sandy lagoon. And we call this um, geomorphic zonation, different zones of reefs. Um, and if you visited these different geomorphic zones, you'd see they look really, really different. And so we want to be capturing those kind of differences um, and mapping them um, to understand reefs better. And so I think what Night Schools really highlighted this evening is there's traditionally in science been this trade-off between um, detail, which is on the y-axis, and coverage on the x-axis. So where we're able to make really detailed maps and observations like Pim's Coralscape, maps that are often quite limited in the extent, whereas global um, maps like the ones that I just showed uh, really kind of lack some consistency and spatial resolution. And so we're only really beginning to move into this like space on the top right um, where we're able to start trying to create um, maps with really consistent coverage and like a lot more, a lot more detail. But addressing that trade-off between resolution and detail really kind of pushes the limits of our computing power and technology. And um, we're only really at this point in time able to start attempt this challenge of mapping coral reefs around the world in a lot more in detail. And so I want to introduce you at this point to Chris Wolfsmith and Stuart Finn. So these are faculty at the University of Queensland's Remote Sensing Research Centre. And essentially they're a team of satellite geeks with over 70 years remote sensing experience between them. And they love coral reefs and they're crazy about diving as well. And since the early 2000s, they've been trying to develop this methodology to map their favorite reef. This is Heron Reef on the Great Barrier Reef using a combination of satellite imagery that was available to them, but also field data to kind of ground truth and create these really beautiful detailed um, habitat maps. And it's tricky to do because um, because of the difficulties of remote sensing through water with refraction and things like that. So it took a long time to develop a methodology um, to map Heron Reef in detail. But over 18 years, they, they really refined this. Um, and once they got beautiful maps, they started trying to apply the methodology that they created to 20 neighboring reefs on the Great Barrier Reef to, um, to test it. And they did that in 2016 and then started scaling. So 2017, they mapped. 200 reefs in detail. And finally, just last year, we're able to map the whole Great Barrier Reef in a lot of detail. Um, but the Great Barrier Reef is big, but it's to take this um, same methodology to the global scale and map every single reef, every single blue dot on Earth is a whole different ball game. Um, and clearly this isn't something that we can do like, manually by hand. Um, so there's some key differences in the methodology we had to adopt to try and map well, reefs right around the planet in that level of detail. And so I'm going to use a baking analogy to walk you through our methodology, just mainly because I like cake. Um, so the first step in creating a coral reef atlas is you'll need some ingredients. And those ingredients are going to be reliable and accurate high resolution input data. And you'll need somebody to collect those ingredients. And this little fellow is a Dove nano satellite. So he's only about 60 centimeters long and 10 by 10 centimeters wide, kind of a shoebox size. Um, and there's a constellation of around 200 of these shoebox size planet doves um, orbiting Earth at a very low level and imaging every single coral reef on Earth every single day with a 3.7 meter pixel spatial resolution. So much more fine resolution than that 30 meter um, Landsat imagery we're looking at before. And so the doves were built by a startup company called Planet who managed to source more than $50 million in venture capital by launching iPhones on rockets as a proof of concept. Um, they launched their first fleet, uh, their first constellation in 2016, and they're currently at the fifth generation of satellites and cameras, and they're continually improving them as they launch them. Um, but it's really the first time in history that the space industry is starting to become privatized, which means this kind of information is not just available to big governments and space agencies, but satellite data is really becoming more accessible and affordable and allowing us to do these kind of science projects. And so the ingredients that these dogs are collecting aren't just pictures, but actually data. So every pixel that the satellite is collecting 
is surface reflectance data on different spectra. So information about the amount of blue, green, and red light reflecting back off the surface of Earth. And this data can be used to calculate things like the symmetry or depth as well. And oceanographers can also provide us with information on things like wave energy as well. And if you remember back to my previous slide, light, depth, and waves are three elements that really help us determine some of that geomorphic zonation and what kind of reef um, is growing. So that information is the key for the maps. And next we need a kind of recipe or rules about what our map's going to eventually look like with the different map classes. So this part of the project really meant bridging the divide between how coral reef scientists see and understand the reef and talk about the reef and all its features, but also the limitations of what we can detect remotely from the satellites as well. And we had to come up with a geomorphic classification system um, where we developed very clear rules about what these different zones meant in terms of some of that data. And we're producing three different maps, um, an outline map firstly, um, a geomorphic zone map, and then also a benthic map, which has a little bit more information about what's growing on the reef in terms of coral or whether it's more sandy or rocky. And the rules are linked to um, the kind of information that we can pull from the satellites. Um, and so armed with this rule set, we then use that traditional methodology that was developed by Chris and Stuart to map Heron Reef to create really small training maps or reference maps. And these are just about 20 by 20 kilometers. We use a technique called object-based classification that kind of groups areas in the imagery that looks really similar. And because that process is kind of monitored by humans, we can just double check these reference maps and um, that they're really, really accurate and we're really confident in them. So they'll look something like this. So the next step for any kind of baking, um, you'll need some serious processing power to run the analyses. Um, so the computing power to process all of these ingredients are only really available in Google Earth Engine. So it's kind of like our food processor. It uses something called parallel processing on the server side, which means that all the big operations being run are using Google's immense computing power. And what we do is we input all that satellite data collected and any derived products into Google Earth Engine. Uh, and then we also pop in our training maps that we created as well. And a kind of algorithm we developed called a random forest then examines all of those training data and starts learning. And it learns and it learns, and then it uses the data layers and what it's learned from the training maps to then automatically map the reefs and the features it can see in the rest of the world. And we apply some cleanup um, processing after that um, and do some checks, and then the maps get released. And so I said the algorithm does it for the rest of the world. Actually, we're kind of running this operation in a um, region by region basis. And so the map's slowly being rolled out over time. So it's more like baking 30 cakes than just one cake. And then I guess the final part of any baking exercise is when you create something, you're going to want to taste it to see what can be improved. And so as each region's produced, we need to actually check and verify it using real world data. Um, so we actually visit, go visit some of these reefs in the field. Um, and check that those pixels and what we're seeing in those pixels actually match up to what we're mapping. And so really, um, that's really important for the validation of the maps and also like calibration for our reference maps as well. And that's been a large part of my job in the project. Essentially, the team um, tie a GPS to my butt and go send me off to some of these reefs and get me to jump in the water and check that the pixel data match up with what we're seeing underwater. When I tell um, my mom and dad that I'm off on field work again, I'm pretty sure they think this is what I'm up to. But of course, the reality of field work isn't always so glamorous. This is us working on the Great Barrier Reef in winter. And remote working often means you share amenities with lots of weird creatures as well. So here we are trying to do our mapping work and a very curious sea snake has come along um, to see what we're up to. Um, we'll spend generally uh, seven to eight hours in the water just traversing as much reef as we can, getting as much coverage, imaging as much as we can with our cameras. And then generally at the end of the day, we'll come back from diving and we'll spend a lot of time uploading and collating and organizing all that data in a way that we can use it to start um, validating and calibrating our mapping. You can see that it can be a bit seasick making. Um, so one of the problems that our team 
faced was COVID meant we couldn't get to our field sites anymore. And so we reached out to everybody that we knew working on reefs and asked if they had any georeference photo data that we could use for our maps. And what's been really cool about that is um, how the community has responded and people from all over the world have sent us georeference photo data to help improve our maps. And so we've been really harnessing teamwork and local knowledge to improve these maps and make them really, really good for the users. And the final part in any um, baking exercise is, of course, the cooks. And so there's a really broad team at UQ involved in the mapping from the field team and um, people like me that are helping develop some of the map classes to then expert mappers and technicians creating the training maps and preparing and processing the satellite data. And the maps are part of a much broader collaboration with several partners, people um, like Planet who are providing the imagery and Arizona State University who are leading a lot of the work at the moment. And of course, uh, you need a good leader as well. So in case you were wondering why it's called the Allen Coral Atlas, I had to mention the late Paul Allen, who was the co-founder of Microsoft and his philanthropic company is um, how the Atlas was funded and it was really his vision and legacy. And Ruth Gates was an exceptional coral reef scientist and the director of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And it was her concept really. And sadly, we lost both of these inspirational science, um, people at the beginning of the project, but hoping that this online habitat map that's going to be made freely available to people is going to be a really great legacy to help support science and conservation. And so um, I'm running out of time. So there's a little QR code in the top um, the top right if you want to visit the Atlas or you can visit alancrollatlas.org to see our progress. And we're after we had like um, five to kind of six test sites to, um, to prove that we could do it. And we're getting pretty far with our 30 regions. So hopefully by the end of next month, we'll have mapped most of the planet. We're in about 80 now and if you enter the website you can see all the beautiful satellite imagery and explore all the reefs and anywhere where they've been mapped um, you'll be able to see the geomorphic and benthic layers and you'll also be able to um, freely download those maps as well so what's been really exciting to us is how it's been used by conservation practitioners to make decisions and for example just last January um, scientists in Sri Lanka used these maps to help design a new marine park which is really exciting um, and so, yeah, it's more than just a, a tool, I guess. It's really like we wanted to make this a hub and place for the community. And so that's your opportunity to get involved if you're interested. It's really great um, when we have people jump on and have a look at the Atlas and how they might use it. There's some nice teaching resources on there as well. Um, if you know of people that we might be able to connect to, um, for more data sets to help improve the atlas that would be great or spotting errors um, as well so i'd encourage you to jump on and have a play hi emma hey um that was fascinating um really cool to see everything that's been happening with it um we have time for some questions I'm trying to figure out what's the best one to start with, but we'll just pick, we'll go with Anne. Do these maps just show location or do they also detect change in size? That's a really good question. So currently they, they started off just being um, static maps of the location of some of these different zones, but the Arizona State University last, um, just last week, released a bleaching detection algorithm. So they're also using the satellites to actually start to look to where we're seeing changes in time um, in bleaching and where reefs are whitening, seeing if we can detect those, that bleaching in real time and report on it from space. Um, Christopher asked, have the reef data pointed you to an amazing previously unknown reef location? So far, no. But what has been really nice are the areas, um, for example, a lot of on the Andaman Sea and Myanmar, where the local researchers there just didn't have any, um, didn't have any maps at all. And so for them, that was really, really exciting. And it's amazing how poorly some areas of the world are mapped as well. So we were working up on the very northern Great Barrier Reef a year ago, and the skipper um, was 
downloading some of the satellite imagery to be able to see some of the detail and look out for potential navigation hazards that weren't available on the charts because they hadn't been mapped previously. So, yes, yeah. Cool. Um, Sarah is just curious, why did you name your algorithm Random Forest? Oh, so that's actually the name for the mathematical, um, the mathematical formula. Oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble trying to explain why it's called random forest, but I think it's to do with the way that it that it learns. Um, it's a bit like a network, so it makes a lot of decisions and then splits and tests and keeps making decisions. And so the decision pathways end up looking a little bit like a tree in the branches of a tree is my understanding of it. But we might need to Google that later and double check. <laughs> cool. Um, how often are the, those satellites taking images and how often does the map refresh? That's also a really good question. And so the satellites are taking images daily and planets do share those, that imagery. But what we find is if there's clouds and things in the way, then you don't get a really fresh image of the reef. So the reality is you might only see the reef like once every 10 days or in some really cloudy areas, you just get a glimpse of it now and again. And so creating the satellite mosaic that if you go onto the website and explore and want to look at reefs actually involved um, the scientists kind of stitching together perfect imagery that was also taken at the same tide time as well, because obviously the tide's rising and falling, um, you'll get different types of images as well. And so on the website, we just produce like one annual image each year for people to use like once a year. It's a perfect one. So I think there's a 2018 and a 2019 perfect global satellite kind of mosaic image on there. Um, although, yes, in theory, if you go on the planet website, there's little um, nano satellites up there imaging every single day or doing their best to. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Once a year is probably good enough. Um, Tracy asked, did you notice anything in particular when you first started doing location checking dives early on that were recurring elements that weren't matching up with the same satellite data? Yeah, it's interesting. We've got better as a team as well. We've started to learn and it's amazing seeing my team, the more time we spend in the field, they're getting better at just looking at a satellite image and we start having little bets with each other. We're like, I think that's like a big bunch of seagrass there, but we might need to to check but yeah there's definitely some things are quite difficult to distinct distinguish and you've got to remember these are 3.7 kind of five meter ish so you can't see individual corals or anything like that so it's just really a lot of colors and and shapes and knowledge about geomorphic zonation that we that we're going on so for example i mean one thing that's really hard to distinguish um is whether a reef is completely alive or completely dead. So you can see it's very bright for that short period of time that it's bleaching. But mm -hmm. after the corals die, they get covered in algae and algae are photosynthetic, just like corals are. And so the kind of signal that's coming through in the spectra look very similar. And so you don't always know when you're going to visit a reef, whether it's a reef that's full of living corals or a reef that's full of dead corals. And that's sometimes the surprising and sometimes sad bit when you go in, jump in somewhere with that GPS tied to you, but. <laughs> um, you are getting so many questions, Emma. Um, let's see this one by Frankly. Do you see corals in one reef location affected by weather events that happen in other parts of the world? For example, typhoons in India showing noticeable changes to reefs in Jamaica. That's a, that's a really good question. Generally, I think impacts like storm impacts do tend to be like very like very localized. So where we do see cyclone impacts on reefs, I and mean, because in a way the, they're protected a lot by that that water, it takes quite a lot to um to actually damage and pull up some of those structures. And it's usually just the path of the cyclones and the typhoons which cause like quite like sustained damage, but maybe often only over five hundred meters or like a like a kilometer kind of kilometer width. But um, yeah, it's it's Definitely there's stuff like that we're getting from in terms of turbidity of the water as well. So the kind of murkiness is really interesting when we're seeing monsoon events and then lots of runoff and the waters around the reefs go kind of um, like more murky and it's hard to see the reefs from the satellite and then we can't map them 
so well. So yeah, there's definitely knock-on effects of some of these things, but I think for cyclones and typhoons, it's generally quite localized. Um, last question, what do you think is the ETA for mapping the entire world? So it's supposed, we're on it, I think we're on 80% at the moment. So it's yeah. supposed to be finished this by the end of July. I've just started a new job at AIM, so I keep checking uh, checking in with my team to see how, how they're going, but it looks like they're making pretty good progress. So I would keep checking in um, on that website and, and see how they're going, but definitely getting there. Um, thank you so much, Emma, for coming on night school with us. Um, I think Christina left the Alan Coral Atlas link in the chat. So if you want to check it out, um, go look for the link in the chat. Um, thanks so much, Emma. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It's nice to see you all online. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. And now we'll bring up Christina. Hello. Here I am. Hello, um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, special thanks to our speakers tonight, Jules, Pim, Emma. This was really fun. Um, I know I learned a lot. I think a lot of people learned a lot. So thanks for coming on. Um, next week, uh, we are doing cave life. Um, so we'll learn about bats, blind shrimp, and the fascinating range of life found in caves across the Southern United States and Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Um, we'll answer uh, questions like, how do hundreds of thousands of bats exit a cave in a matter of minutes without resulting in an airborne traffic jam? Um, obviously I read that question because I would not know how to say that that quickly. Um, but we'll also go underwater um, to discover biodiversity and conservation of unique subterran subterranean estuaries. Um, so come back next week and join us. Yeah, and um, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you know when we're back. Um, and also, like I don't think I've said this before, but all the recordings that we do, these live programs, they stay right where um, you are right now at this YouTube URL. So if you know somebody who would be really into this program, share the link around. It will stay here for as long as YouTube exists. So um, <laughs> yes. Uh, we have a whole playlist on our YouTube channel, like our past 50 programs. So spread it far and wide. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, thanks again to everyone. A special thanks to Pim for helping us kind of come up with the concept for this program. We had a blast. And uh, have a good night, everybody.